folks, we'll go ahead and get started then for this morning. Um, thanks for joining us. I can't believe it's already the end of September. <laughs> uh, we're here. I don't know how we got here, but here we are. Um, so we've got quite a bit actually that's happened in the last few weeks. Um, obviously, uh, I think this morning it would be really nice if we all just took a moment um, to uh, pay respects, not just, uh, well, first to our RBG, um, as that happened at the beginning of the week, and then um, we know that social workers and the country are also reeling over um, what happened in Kentucky with the Breonna Taylor case and the seemingly lack of justice there. Um, so if we could just take a moment, um, that would be wonderful. Great, thank you. Um, we are uh, at the national level, um, we're kind of following the, the guidance of the Kentucky chapter uh, in terms of what's going on um, there and supporting protesters um, as they continue to be active um, throughout the state and, and nation. I know there's been several um, also in Michigan. Um, Max is gonna be putting out a statement around uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg um, early next week, so be on the lookout for that also soon. Um, but we want to make sure that in our social work circles that we are also taking time to reflect on what's going on in the world, what's impacting us, and there's a lot impacting us right now. So um, I'm glad you all could be here with us. So for today, Wait, we're going to um, uh, go ahead. Did, did you get my Kentucky statement? Uh, no, but it, I saw the Kentucky statement. Okay, because I sent it to you, so. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, today, we're gonna kind of follow some of the same models we've done for our last two calls. We're gonna just give a few more resources around COVID-19 as that as the pandemic continues on. Uh, talk about some of the advocacy and policy uh, action alerts, both here at the state uh, and the national level. Um, talk about some continuing efforts around racial justice and anti-racist practice. Lots of training opportunities to come up, um, and then we'll do some member demos and answer any questions that come in at the end. All right, so as it relates to the coronavirus, um, we just wanna make sure folks are continually aware that NSW is updating resources regularly on the national website. Um, we are continuing to hold, at least right now, our bi-monthly peer support group for clinicians during COVID-19. Um, we have seen in the last month, month and a half, that that particular uh, group has dwindled in size quite significantly. So we're looking at revamping how um, we do that or if we kind of fold it into some of the private practice conversations that we have. Um, if there are any clinicians on this call um, that have thoughts about that particular group and what you need um, during these times, please let us know. Um, you can either let us know on this, this call today um, or if you want to send us an email separately, we will likely also be sending out um, some correspondence in the next couple of weeks, kind of getting member feedback about how they would like to see that particular group proceed. Um, and really the, the, the goal of that group is for social workers to have a place where they can come regularly to um, talk about what's going on in their practice as it relates to the ongoing pandemic, to share resources and to talk about cases. Um, Max, do you have anything else you want to add about that particular group? Well, I think it's, it's really important that people on the call today, maybe if you could put in the chat box um, whether you would like to see that group continue. Um, the purpose was because those of us who are doing clinical work were being swamped and feeling overloaded with folks who were struggling with COVID. I don't believe that that has stopped for therapists, but if you'd like those groups to continue, could you just please comment in the chat box um, so we can get a sense of whether it's a need or not? Yeah, I think one of the things I've also been talking to some um, clinicians about as it relates to ongoing pandemic and kind of what research shows is there's usually like this six month um, initial time period, which we just kind of crossed when you have 
really large pandemics or national issues where um, that's when people are kind of getting used to anything new that's changing. They're adjusting their life, their self-care strategies. Um, but I know as we get into colder months, we want to make sure that we're all kind of aware of how that's going to change if we can't be outdoors as much, if we're uh, losing vitamin D. Um, so how are we talking about those and preparing our clients, right, to handle winter as it, it comes forward? Um, so uh, we'll continue to have those conversations with members over the next few months. The other resources I want just for folks to know about um, that may or may not um, impact folks on this particular call is, um, sorry, our Facebook is trying to get back up. Uh, ASWB has formed a good uh, resource around regulatory provisions. So if you are curious about, um, if you have a client that's out of state temporarily, there's a lot of things that have changed at least for in the short time or in the short term around social work practice. Uh, I'll quickly just show what that looks like. So if you go to the ASWB website, which is ASWB.org, you've got this orange tab right in the middle, COVID-19 updates. And if you click that, there's a few things. The regulatory provisions is what we're talking about. So you can click on that and choose whatever state you're interested in learning more about um, and see what has kind of changed during the pandemic. So you can see here in Michigan, the executive orders, but you could go to whichever particular state and if anything has changed and how that impacts social work practice. So many states have opened up allowing practitioners from outside of their jurisdictions to practice um, at least temporarily. And so that, that's great during the pandemic time. So just in case we've gotten quite a few questions over the pandemic about, hey, I've got a client who's stuck at home or is not going to be moving back temporarily. Um, can I see them? So this is a, a good tool for that. Um, the other resources around Pearson View. So for anybody who is taking their tests, uh, ASWB exam, the testing sites are open again um, and have been for several months now. In Michigan, it hasn't been as big of an issue than in some other states. But if you are curious about trying to find the testing date and time, uh, you can go to pearsonview.com and see kind of their updates. There is some changes to uh, how they operate just because of the pandemic and um, precautions that they're taking. Um, so that's a good resource for folks. The National Office put out a couple of new um, practice updates the last couple of weeks that I wanted to highlight for folks. The first one is around school social workers specifically. So if anybody on this call or if you know folks who are in schools, um, this is a joint statement and resources from NASW, ASWB, and CSWE. And so it covers um, anything from K through 12 to higher education. Um, and talking about things around housing, food insecurity, um, and the role of social work kind of at all levels of student engagement. Um, and so uh, I'll, I'll include the link to this presentation in the chat box. So if anybody wants to actually click through these links at some point, you can have access to that. Um, the other resource that they put out, I believe this was just earlier this week, is um, updates around homebound care um, and uh, what that means during the pandemic uh, in terms of telehealth and payment. So for folks who are doing home care for folks, this is a really uh, good tool as it relates to, sorry, um, uh, Medicare specifically and beneficiaries. So those two uh, alerts also came through an email. Your NASW national emails generally will look like they're called member links. So um, those are the ones that will have updates like this in it. And then lastly, the, the update that I wanted folks to just be aware of as it relates to liability. We know a lot of things have shifted in terms of liability since the pandemic. Um, Assurance Services, NASW's liability wing, um, has developed a bunch of resources uh, since the start of the pandemic. Um, a lot of good forms that people can use as it relates to telehealth, as well as they started a series of videos around um, ethics as well as um, uh, other practice tips during the pandemic. So they've got anything from technology basics and how to start using apps. Um, so just wanted to let people know that that resource is also available. And most of those are free whether you're a member or not.
Um, the other updates around COVID-19 is NASW has a bunch of free trainings on their uh, online learning platform around COVID-19. So they range from supporting for nursing home residents and caregivers to legal and ethical considerations to Medicare updates. So if you're looking for some CEs and um, also just want more information about what's going on, these are all available there. And then they continue, the National Office continues to sign on and do a lot of advocacy work around COVID-19, um, whether that's at the legislative level or at the level like at ASWB. Uh, and I know they've recently sent out some, some more current things around ASWB and some states having some uh, more uh, bigger problems in terms of their new licensees being able to practice. All right, so switching gear, any, any questions around COVID stuff or any things that you all are, are observing in your practice that you want to make sure that we talk about today? Just I, All right. one of the things that I'm noticing is the combination of seasonal affective disorder and COVID-19 um, is leading to, for many of my clients, major depression episodes, especially complicated with um, seasonal affective and um, isolation. So I'd be curious if, if other people have experienced that. Um, so I just wanted to mention that as, as something that you may want to think about for the clinical support group. Yeah, there's a meme going on around right now, too, that I saw this week that, like, my regular depression is being compounded by my COVID depression, which is being compounded by my seasonal affective depression, right? I mean, it's supposed to be like a play on everything, but I feel like that's exactly kind of what you're talking about. It's like these compounding things are adding up. And, I, you know, especially as we go into the winter months here, how are we um, uh, supporting our clients and ourselves, right? All right, so in terms of some of the advocacy um, stuff, uh, there are a couple of action alerts that came out from the national office in the last couple of weeks. Algeria, I don't know if you have any uh, specific information about these, but there's one around the Counseling Not Criminalization in Schools Act, as well as Medicare reimbursement for 2021. Um, this one just came out recently, it was earlier this week. Um, and so uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services have kind of done two things. They've increased some billing from, for some certain codes for social workers, but they've also changed uh, one of their policies that reduced payments to all Medicare providers. So obviously we are worried about that because a lot of social workers provide um, those sort of services. And then the other, um, the other act is the Counseling Not Criminalization in Schools Act. Uh, so we, we know that it, now that schools are virtual, this it, it is, looks a little bit different probably, but it's really important that we, we work on both of these issues. There is quick action alerts through both of those. I'll give a quick demo on how to, actually I'll do that quickly right now too. Um, so if you go to the national NASW site, socialworkers.org, um, A, the first thing that will happen is nationals will send you a direct advocacy link that will say, hey, this is what's going on. We want you to take action. Please do this, whether it's fill out this form, contact your legislators, um, or something else. And so uh, when you're on this page, what you'll do is you will uh, go to, there's a couple different things here. You can see legislative alerts. Um, you'll see those first two ones that I mentioned are right here. And so the, uh, let's say the Medicare reimbursement one, you can get more information. And then uh, I'm not logged in right now, but if you're logged in, all of your contact information will already be filled in here. Um, and then it will go into a submit item. So they make it all really easy to uh, advocate and give you kind of the full range of information here. Um, and then you can see the other one, the, the co-sponsoring, it's very similar sort of form. Some of them look a little bit differently depending on how the advocacy needs to be done, um, but they'll tell you what the bill does and sometimes what it does not do depending on uh, what we're looking for members to get involved with. So really easy to take action on those items there. Um, those are a couple of the national things. 
And then we've got some fake stuff going on. Awesome. Thanks, Dwayne. I was on mute. <laughs> um, so as you all know, uh, we're in the thick of the budget season. Um, the budget typically needs to be delivered to Governor Whitmer from the legislature, legislature by October 1st. And there was a lot of um, contention around how to spend the federal dollars and, you know, what to spend those federal dollars on. But the legislature has prepared a budget um, and that budget has gone over to the governor's office and you may have seen a lot of communication around that um, over the past couple of days. Um, if we go over to, and this is just a, a graphic and I'll send this out in our emails, uh, in my policy email blast that you receive in the next couple of days, just to get social workers a little bit more um, familiar about the budget process and the timeline, and then also actions that they could be taking um, during those months leading up to um, the budget. So if we go to our next slide, we'll, you'll see um, just some areas around the budget. So I get questions a lot about, well, where can I view the budget? What's included in the budget? So the House Physical Analysis, or sorry, the House Physical Agency, um, they do analysis um, for all the budget items. Um, you'll see the Education Omnius Budget, which is Senate Bill 927. They'll have an analysis on their website. Um, and that's everything K through 12 related. And then you'll see the um, general omni, omnibus, uh, omnibus bus budget um, for departments and other major uh, budget areas, which is House Bill 5396. And they'll have an analysis on that as well. Um, and so they break those down by different departments. For social work, we spend a lot of time looking at the Department of Health and Human Services budget, which tends to be the largest budget within uh, the general funds. But some major highlights, and this will also be included in the email that I'll send out. Um, but we've had a member actually who's been working very hard um, through their program up in Traverse City to try to get funding for the 10 cents a meal program. And they were happy to announce that $2 million um, was included within the budget for the 10 cents a meal program. And that allows for healthy food for children and schools and really helps to secure a, a stronger local food system. Uh, you'll see increases in Medicaid spending for uh, the rising caseloads um, for, for traditional Medicaid. Um, you'll see additional funding also for Healthy Michigan. Uh, there's an increase uh, in funding for the assistance and public assistance caseloads. So we know COVID um, really has required a lot of people to make different economic shifts and we've seen a rise in public assistance. So uh, there was $43.2 million allocated uh, to increase the um, rising number of public assistance caseloads. $19.1 million uh, was provided to give uh, more staff um, and system improvements around the behavioral health services, um, but specifically to improve children's mental health services. A uh, $5 million increase to add 60 positions for direct care staffing at four of the state's psychiatric hospital centers. Um, there, were, there was $23.4 million to expand the number of behavioral health homes um, by 9,245 enrollees. Uh, $36.5 million increase to pay for the state's projected share of indigenous defense costs. And then $23.5 million uh, for Healthy Moms, Healthy Baby programs, which is really to help address some issues around um, maternal health and infant mortality and things of that sort. Um, so what you see here really is just a um, bare bones budget. There were federal dollars that needed to be spent um, from the CARES Act and Michigan made decisions to focus right now on what they felt was most pertinent. Over the next 11 months, what you'll see is supplemental budget uh, packages um, to help um, provide more relief and more programming in different areas. If there's more federal relief that comes in, um, 
you'll see, you know, an increase to other other programs and areas as well. Um, but, you know, thank, honestly, NASW on the national level and some of our congressional leaders because they fought for um, the corona, coronavirus relief and the CARES Act, which really helped balance the budget and get a lot of these, um, make a lot of these funds possible. So moving on to the next one, I just want to briefly talk about some legislation um, highlights or some legislation that you should be paying attention to or legisl and legislation that NASW um, has been a part of in the last couple of you know, months, days, <laughs> um, years. <laughs> so Clean Slate Expungement um, is an initiative led by um, really safe and just Michigan and um, ACLU and a lot of criminal legal um, advocacy groups. However, NASW has supported it as well. Um, and it's been a long process, but it finally has passed and is ready for the signature from Governor Whitmer. Um, the Kinship Care and Kinship Navigator Program, the legislation was actually signed by Governor Whitmer yesterday. So that's great. Um, we have social workers who sit on um, some of those boards and we've weighed in on the legislation. So I'm happy to see that program um, being uh, signed by the governor. The Senate Judiciary yesterday took up testimony um, for the legislation around uh, fr coming from the task force on jail and pretrial incarceration. Um, there's a lot of legislation there and ultimately what the, the legislation is meant to do is really help reduce mass incarceration across the state of Michigan. Um, and there's just been such a huge effort um, and we have some social, we have a social worker that, you know, set on that task force and helped to really get a lot of legislation introduced around behavioral health. So I look forward to seeing um, more develop on, on that situation. Wyatt's Law, it passed in the Senate Judiciary with quite a few amendments. It's been um, very contentious legislation. Um, to try to protect children um, from future abusers. And um, we were able to work to make it as least harmful as possible for um, adults, as well as uh, powerful for um, children. Also, you'll see legislation from Senator Bison um, that'll be introduced, or sorry, it was actually introduced a few days ago um, but ultimately, what it's going to do is allow for a parent who's incarcerated and on child support to have that child support pay those child support payments suspended until they're released. Um, so we know that this will really help, um, you know, when it comes to reintegrating reintegrating back into society that this large debt won't be on over their heads, and they'll be able to have some time to be able to, um, you know incrementally work to to pay off that child support balance and still be able to take care of their children. Uh, so moving on to the next um, slide. So we've received a, quite a few questions about obviously telehealth, but telehealth as it relates um, to really just return to work. Should I return to work? Should I continue to do telehealth? Um, and the emergency order 2021-38, it has encouraged the use of telehealth services um, for all healthcare providers, which would also include social workers. Um, however, many agencies are saying you can come back to work. And um, there are, you know, professionals who are like, should I? Is this in the best safety of my client? So, um, and Max, feel free to, to talk to this, um, but you know, what we have been advising social workers who've called about this is just to use your own discretion based on, you know, what your clients need and, and what your employers have provided for you as it relates to safety for everyone. So if the employer has PPE for staff and clients, um, there aren't any like autoimmune diseases or illnesses, um, maybe the social worker, you can return to work, you know, if, if you feel fine about that um, and you think your, your clients will be safe. You know, however, if your employer doesn't have sufficient PP for staff and um, clients and you would pose your, yourself or your client, um, 
you know, who has an autoimmune deficiency, deficiency at risk, um, then you need to, to use your discretion and think about what's best for everyone. Um, so that's kind of, you know, what we've been advising. We know it's tricky um, because social workers are essential workers, um, but some people, you know, they don't have access to telehealth communication or they may not have a safe space um, to be able to do their services. So just use your discretion. Um, yeah, and for people in private practice, I think it's helpful if you can have um, if you're going to see people in person, if you can have a form available that says, you know, that the client understands the risk involved in seeing you in person and um, that you will not be held liable in if should anyone develop COVID, however you want to word it, there are some examples available, but I think that reduction of liability statement can be really helpful. Good advice, Max, for sure. Okay, um, so yesterday, actually I think it was midnight, MDHHS, they send out their emails at like midnight, um, I guess so people can see them first thing when they wake up in the morning. Um, but they had an announcement in their email yesterday that they're working um, with Health Information Technology Commission to write a new five-year health IT roadmap. Um, and the roadmap will help shape the future of health and human services, IT functionality for public and private entities across the state, um, better data availability and sharing digital tools and technical assistance for patients and providers. Um, but they're looking to um, hold a series of virtual stakeholder forums to collect input on specific topics. And they encourage residents, clinicians, health and human service providers, um, data and technology professionals, and anyone who may be interested to sign up. Um, you can find that more information about that if you go to their website and click on their news area. Um, and you can see when those forums are and sign up for those forums. Um, it seems like, you know, many clinicians deal with things like champs and um, other, data and things of that sort um, within MDHHS. So I would definitely encourage you all to take a look at it. Um, we talked about this on our last call last month. Um, CHAMPS is just doing, MDHHS is doing a CHAMPS 101 webinar series. Um, it was a six week series to um, almost like a refresher for those who are new to, you know, the Medicaid billing process um, and they are doing these through October 7th. So there are going to be two more opportunities or sorry three more two more opportunities so uh, September 30th and October 7th um, if you have missed those and those will you know um, be on specific topics but that information is also on their website. All right um, and Dwayne, did you want to speak about anything here racial justice related or should I pause and ask if anyone has a, a question about any of the updates that I mentioned? We can start with any questions folks may have about any of the legislative stuff. All right. Keep in mind these calls are just short calls with quick <laughs> bits of information, but um, I do provide more information in the emails. So please make sure you sign up um, on our advocacy tab for those emails. Great. Thanks, Elvira. Um, there's a lot going around around racial justice and anti-racist practice work, um, both at internally at NASW and then externally within the social work field. Um, NASW is putting out stuff pretty regularly, and at least weekly, there's something coming out um, for members. Uh, all of the chapter staff continue to be part of a national weekly, um, uh, weekly group around racial justice at the uh, National Task Force, and then all three of uh, the staff who are on this call today are also on additional subcommittees. 
Um, so we are working internally within NASW to help um, direct and draft uh, messaging and policy and educational programming. Um, but we want to hear from you all also in terms of what you would like to see the association do, what would you like to see us do here in Michigan, um, and then broader throughout the profession. Uh, there's a lot going on. Uh, the National Office is hosting a series of forums starting next week, actually. Um, they are CEs available for those, but they are going to cover a whole host of topics. Um, it's one per week. Um, you can learn more about those at the National website um, as well. But there's a few good resources to make sure that you know about. The National Office, just like the COVID response page, they have a whole um, section of their website devoted to racial justice work. There also is the Racial Justice Toolkit, which um, Algeria pulled together for our first town hall, which was a few months ago now, but it's really still very relevant um, in terms of uh, re resources for practice and social work. Um, and then the National Office also recently put out um, eight ethical considerations for responding to social injustice. So really, what does our code of ethics tell us about what's going on right now? Um, and with that particular article, um, we're going to be hosting a, a virtual webinar on October 22nd with our Region 10 representative, Ellen Crane, um, specifically around ethical considerations around racial injustice. And we're going to use that eight ethical guide as a tool for that particular session. Um, our Social Justice and Anti-Racism Committee here in Michigan met for the first time in early September. Uh, we will be meeting again in October. We're finalizing that date now through a doodle poll. So if you're interested in participating in that work, um, be on the lookout for an email blast and on the website for, for that information shortly. Um, the National Office is going to be hosting their next uh, National Town Hall next Friday from 2 to 3 p.m. And that focus is going to be on racial equity, economic equity, and COVID-19. Um, so that is going to be live at 2 o'clock. Feel free to join us on, on that platform. All right. And so those are just a couple quick updates around that. And then we can move into some political news. Absolutely. So um, let's see here. So in PACE, um, so Michigan's Political Action Committee, we have met over the past couple of months trying to, to figure, trying to determine who we want to endorse um, as a committee. So we've endorsed so far 14 um, candidates who are seeking state level office and five candidates seeking a local office, which is including judges or prosecutors. Um, the pictures that you'll see here are just a few of the recent ones that we have endorsed, um, not comprehensive of all, but I was really excited um, to see that, you know, the candidates we've selected, a lot of other organizations are supporting as well. Um, you know, these candidates were selected based on um, really their support for social workers, our clients and our issues. Um, on the national level, however, um, you know, our national office also runs a PACE or a PAC, um, and their PACE committee has endorsed around 118 candidates who are seeking election for Congress. Um, for Michigan, they've endorsed um, Congressman Dan Kildee, uh, Kimberly Bison, uh, Hillary Shelton, and Gary Peters. There is more time um, for us to put forth more recommendations um, for other individuals that NASW on the national level so sh should support. Should support. Um, I can think of a few um, that I know I'd be interested in, you know, seeing our national office support, but, you know, I always encourage members to send over information uh, or names, you know, if they think NASW um, on a chapter level should get more information to our national level about candidates running for Congress who we should support. It looks like I see um, a name here in the chat. So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, but yeah, that's our upcoming time pace. Um, quick question. Um, I heard that Gary Peters was falling behind um, or had lost some points, some percentage points. Um, is that accurate information? Yeah, I'm not you know. sure. 
honestly. I don't know. I would have to um I would have to look into that. I think it's critical. No, it's not that... generally accurate, Max. Okay. That's a fund it's generally a fundraising tactic. It's very similar to what Biden did for some of his ads in Michigan saying that there was a poll that showed him down one, but it's not reality at this point. That doesn't mean that people should not donate and get out. Um, I know uh, last month I um, got to meet with Senator Peters. He was doing his motorcycle tour. And so I got to um, hang out with him in a six foot distance when we were, he was driving through uh, the Northeast side of the state. Um, and so we talked about some critical things, including telehealth. But yeah, I mean, his race is not nationally on the most competitive side, um, but still could use support. I know fundraising, he's behind John James, um, but not polling wise. Um, a couple of the other uh, updates around uh, political stuff. So the national office has also put together a really good resource kit around voter participation and how social workers can inco incorporate voting information into their practice. Uh, I'll show that at the end of today's session. Um, the other uh, note is it, voting is starting now in Michigan, right? So people are getting their absentee ballots quickly. You know, we're encouraging folks, if you can, to directly drop your absentee ballot off if that's how you plan to vote to your clerk's office directly. Um, we know there's a lot of questions about mail and issues with the mail. So if you can avoid that and just directly drop it off to your clerk, um, that's the best option possible. Um, there's a lot of more information on michiganvoting.org or michigan.gov slash vote if you need to find your particular polling location or if you want to look at your ballot now. Um, but I know that there's a huge push for early voting, absentee voting, and we just want to make sure that all social workers are out there um, exercising their right as well as empowering our clients to use their voice. Um, a couple other events as it relates to kind of everything we've talked about so far. Um, on Monday, we're having our first uh, student uh, roundtable discussion at 5.30. It's going to be Zoomed. So if you uh, work with students or you have student interns, please invite them to this. We hope to do four of these over the course of the year. Uh, we really hope that this will be an opportunity for students to be able to network this year, considering that they're most campuses are not on in, having in-person sessions and will provide another way for folks to share resources, to talk about kind of what's going on, how school is looking in a virtual climate, um, and what we need to be um, helping with as a chapter. Um, the other event that we just always want to make sure folks remember is LEAD. It's going to be on October 29th. It's completely virtual this year. It's going to be a fantastic program. Um, we should have Probably the full program will be online, I would guess, probably by next week. Um, we're just finalizing our last few speakers around that. Um, but feel free to sign up now. There are seven CEs for LEAD. Lots of other good stuff coming up soon. The National Office is hosting another uh, webinar on October 7th around embracing climate justice work. Also a hugely important topic right now. Um, that's going to be from 1 to 2 p.m. And there's one CE for that. Um, it is free if you are part of one of the national specialty practice sections um, or $20 otherwise. Um, and then in terms of other local, local, but everything's virtual right now, uh, our Region 3, the northeast side of the state, is going to be having their first meet and greet with their new region rep, Phyllis Kolagross, on October 1st at 7 o'clock. We're doing our Animal Assisted Social Work Conference, which is going to be really fun. On October 9th through 12th, there's 21 CEs involved with that conference. Our October Lunch and Learn is online, and that's going to be on how social workers can promote self-advocacy among clients with disabilities. It should be a really good session. Um, and then kind of as it relates to students and new professionals, we have two sessions scheduled for um, webinars around how to get li licensed in Michigan, the first on November 10th, uh, and a second one in, in the uh, spring, early spring or yeah, late winter. Um, and then we have the two of our licensure exam institutes set. So one's going to be in December, one in May, because we know there are a lot of folks who are wanting to get their exam complete before that switch over from um, ASWB. Um, 
So with kind of that, we've gotten several consistent questions over the last couple of months that I just want to make sure that we address. Um, first, as it relates to continuing education, I think we talked about this last month on our call, but um, one of the common questions I've been getting is how many continuing education credits can I earn through online learning? Um, is, the other question that's been kind of related to that, is the Board of Social Work going to open up the rules to allow for more online learning? Um, and kind of the second half of that question is no, because Michigan social workers can already earn 100% of their CEs online. Um, half have to be through live content, but that doesn't mean in person. So a live webinar counts as live. So any of our lunch and learns, pretty much everything we've done throughout the pandemic would count as a live CE. If it's pre-recorded or if it's like a home study journal booklet that somebody gets or like our virtual book club, those count as what's considered alternative learning. And alternative learning, you can only earn up to 50% of your CEs, um, but you could, in theory, earn 100% online live or 50% through pre-recorded and 50% through live online. Um, the other question as it relates to online stuff that I've gotten a few questions lately is, can I do supervision online, whether I'm supervising a limited licensed person or a staff? Um, staffing it might kind of depend on what your agency policy is, but in terms of your license, Absolutely. Um, limited licensees can be supervised virtually as long as it's live. Um, you just want to make sure, obviously, that you're, you're being HIPAA compliant and very cautious around any confidentiality issues. But supervision can be done through telephone, can be done through Zoom. Um, just, yeah, no, no problem there. And it can be 100%. I know I, I supervise uh, somebody right now uh, outside of my role at NASW, and we, over the summer, we did about half of our, our sessions through telephone or uh, a virtual option. Um, and then the last question is, when do I have uh, until Michigan requires all hours be complete before I can take my ASWB exam? So earlier this summer, we did get clarification from the Board of Social Work that they have uh, waited until they have moved that deadline until the very last possible day, which is June 30th of 2021. So starting in July of next year, any limited licensee will have to have all of their work hours complete in order to be able to sit for their exam. So that's again why we wanted to make sure that we put a couple of prep courses together before that time period. Um, the other thing that we are doing is having some conversations with schools around prep, uh, prep for students, as well as uh, there should be an article coming out in the next bridge. I'm finishing it right now kind of about what we know about the pass rate in Michigan for the ASWB exam, how we can kind of move forward and help enhance those numbers and um, kind of questions that we've been getting from members and schools of social work around, around that test. So those are, are some of the bigger questions we've been getting the last couple of months. Um, but this is a good time if, if folks have other questions that you'd like to, for us to answer now, Any, anything else that's been on your mind? Feel free to type some into the question, uh, the chat box, if anything pops up. Um, just the last couple of updates, uh, other news from NASW. So the National Office has um, kind of revamped their career center, and they've partnered with an organization called Scribble um, to uh, help partner social workers with job opportunities. So it's gonna, it comes with things around um, job alert email notifications, uh, advanced search capacities, as well as some additional resources for employers looking to post. Um, just a reminder for anybody hiring, it is free to post any jobs on the NASW Michigan job site, which is uh, nasw-michigan.org. Um, to post on the National Job Center, there is a fee, um, but we always encourage folks, if they can, to post on both, both of them, uh, if possible. Um, and then, I, I posted in the chat box earlier, there was a new statement coming out, coming out literally while this call was going on around uh, the executive order that came out from the president earlier this week around combating race and sex stereotyping and NASW's big disapproval with that statement and really looking past and kind of trying to pretend that systemic racism and white privilege are not a thing. 
Um, so we, we are aware that that is going on, um, as well as the uh, whistleblower reports of human rights abuses in ICE facilities. Um, and NSW is continuing to address and work on those issues. Uh, the other thing as it relates to kind of all of this that on, on our one of our national calls this week is every administration that gets elected, NASW puts out a transition plan to that administration. So for instance, when the Trump administration came into office, the national NASW puts out a complete guide in terms of policy issues that we wanted to see addressed during that administration. Um, soon, regardless of how the election goes, there will be another transition guide, whether it's the current um, president or if we have a new administration, there will be a new set of kind of policy guidelines that we want to put out as an organization. If folks have ideas and thoughts about what they'd like to see in that, please feel free to reach out to us and we can pass those comments along to the national staff. Um, but that's an important way for NASW to make sure that we're visible to any administration um, as well as we can uh, push social work policy issues. Um, and I think this is the last update I have, and it's just a continual reminder that the Board of Social Work is going to have two open seats coming at the end of this year. Uh, the deadline to apply is next week. I will um, say, if folks are in, oh, go ahead, Aldria. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, we have had two individuals um, come forward who, you know, have been reviewed um, by LSP uh, with strong support. Um, but, you know, we always welcome um, as many applicants as possible. The appointment decision is always up to uh, the director of appointments and the governor's office. Um, however, there still are, you know, other boards um, and we just continue, 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 continue to try to have as many social workers in that social work uh, scope of practice um, embedded. Yeah, and so in terms of those other boards, if you click on that michigan.gov slash appointments, it will go to this page here and you can uh, click all of the boards and commissions that exist in the state. There are tons of them. Um, maybe not all of them would be social work um, appropriate, but there are tons of things on here that um, social workers would be really wonderful fits on and many of them are looking for folks. So I recommend if you're, you're looking for ways to get involved, um, this is a really good place to start. Um, whether you're a student or a retired professional, um, there's some really good options and we wanna make sure that social workers are on as many boards as possible. Um, you can see, uh, see I will say also, um, you know, on our website, we have a link that'll take you directly to the boards and commissions pages. And then um, even though there may be some that are open, um, they're filled on different quarterly basis. Um, so we are privy to that information from the governor's office, um, whether it's a quarter three or quarter four. Quarter three is typically October 1st, Qu quarter four is around um, the end of the year. And then you have uh, quarter one and quarter two appointments. So as we become aware of those specific boards, we'll post them just like Dwayne did um, in these calls and we'll do an ask for members. So, um, but it doesn't hurt to, like Dwayne said, take a look at those um, specific boards and see what they're about and find one that's the best fit for you. And on the Board of Social Work page through Laura, you can see um, when the terms are up for folks. So next year, there'll be three seats open um, and two of them will be social workers and one of them will be a general public person. So this is also a good time if you know somebody who's not a social worker that also maybe works with social workers or has experience with social workers that would be a good fit for the public position, um, thinking about who could fit on that board. Um, so if maybe you're not ready this year, but maybe interested in next year, there'll be two seats open or three seats, two for social workers. Um, the other page I just wanted to show folks as kind of a last um, demo. So going back to the national NASW page, socialworkers.org, uh, I just wanted to give people the direct access to where you can find information around voter uh, participation and voter rights. So again, under the advocacy tools, um, you'll see there's quite a bit of stuff here, policy issues, sign on letters, political action. The political action for candidate election, this is where you can find all of NASW nationals endorsements. Um, under the elections tool, you can see 
increasing voter participation, and that's where there's lots of really good resources for webinars around voter engagement and social work, challenges, eliminating barriers, right, and then some specific websites that can um, be helpful depending on what your community looks like. Um, the other thing that is on this general elections page is um, information around social workers in office, information about why social workers should run for office, um, how endorsements are made at the national level, and then a list of all the current endorsements. So you can go through here, and let me just find Michigan. So Michigan's folks are in this little board right here. Um, but we obviously want to make sure that we are sending over the right people to the national office. So if you have additional suggestions, let us know about that. Um, so that was just one quick demo I wanted to do. The other thing that just I'll continually highlight for members, if you have questions or resources to share broader than just the chapter level, my NASW is a really good platform to use. It's the community for NASW members. So if you click on the My NASW Community, it'll bring you here, and then you can kind of see some of the more um, upcoming events, announcements, or if you go into the actual communities themselves, I'll make you log in. Um, but once you do that, it'll bring up kind of the community forums, and then you can go into the discussions and see all of the conversations that social workers are having across the country. Some of them have tons of replies, some of them are, are just a few, so anything from L, uh, literature on eating disorders, so on resilience, um, you know, training resources for trauma, CBT, tons of stuff on here. Um, and if you've got, you know, questions around ASWB exam and is it oppressive, this is a really also good place for folks to network right now. Um, and if you're looking, if you have a, a question that maybe we don't have an answer to or you want answered by your peers, this is a, a good place to do that. Um, so I just wanted to kind of highlight that. But does anybody have any other questions? I think that's all I had for today. That was very informative. I really am happy that I got to be a part of it and learn a lot from you guys. <laughs> Glad you're here, Gigi. What was that? Oh, yeah. All yep. right. Glad you're here. <laughs> so um, we are, we'll get you out three minutes early today. So I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your Friday. We will be back on the fourth, uh, fourth Friday in October. That will be close to Halloween. So we'll see you all then. Thank you, hope everyone Thank has a you good all. Weekend. Thank you all for the presentation. Bye, Judy. Thank you. Bye. Bye.